if you're expecting Michael Matias, I'm not him. Um, <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Elke Palmer, a uh, very good friend. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. If you haven't been there, you should go there. It's a beautiful place. Not as beautiful as Santa Cruz. Um, and Elke's uh, works in a variety of um, projects. He works on indoor navigation, but for today's talk, he's going to talk about one of his fascinating research uh, interests and research projects, which is games for uh, people with limited vision or blind. Uh, he is going to talk about exercise games for children who are blind. There are not that many out there, and how what you do to help children who are blind if, uh, to exercise. He's also going to talk about how to make, in general, mainstream devices or games accessible for people who are blind. How do you make second life accessible for those who are blind? How to make virtual world in general accessible to those who are blind when there are no textual comparable to all of those cool animation and visual objects. So, thanks so much. <laughs> you shouldn't clap for me yet. Maybe I'll give a super crappy talk and you guys all want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, so this is a little tag cloud of my research interest. I'm uh, very interested in video games. Uh, most of you are in the games program here, I heard. Um, very big fan of video games. Um, I kind of like try to do like understanding how people play video games, um, interaction design of video games, and then specifically I look at um, people with disabilities. I'll talk about it a little bit uh, later. So these are my research interests. Um, these are some of my non-research interests. Uh, I know uh, Sri was kind of dissing Reno a little bit. <laughs> but it's uh, Reno's on one of the few places where you can actually kite surf, snowboard, and you can even combine both of them and uh, snow guiding. So uh, that just gives us a few credits. Um, <coughs> my talk, I'm uh, trying to answer three questions today. Uh, it's a little bit of an elusive topic. Uh, you know, video games for people that are blind is not something you encounter every day. Uh, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit some of the barriers that blind people encounter when they want to play video games. Uh, you guys are all probably aspiring game designers. Um, very few game developers actually accommodate their games so people with disabilities in general can play them. So maybe I can kind of like plan to see today that games should be made more uh, accessible. So I'm going to also provide some, some arguments for why video games uh, should be made accessible. And then I'm going to show a number of like solutions. I have a research lab with a bunch of students who are trying to come up with accessible interfaces for virtual worlds and video games. Okay, let's uh, go back to the basics about, you know, how do people play video games? So if you play like a first-person shooter, how do you play a first-person shooter? Well, you look at the screen, see beautiful visuals, sounds, uh, you might play with a rumble controller, feel uh, haptic feedback. So something happens on the screen, some enemies pop up, you, know, you, you decide what to do, you, know, you shoot at an enemy, uh, you, know, you activate your controller, press the trigger. So when I started this research, I was very interested in kind of like understanding, you know, how do we actually play games? Um, so this is like a little sequence where you get some visual feedback, something happens, you decide what to do, you shoot, do something, something happens on the screen. And this is kind of like something you can generalize to a lot of other types of games. So this is like an uh, exercise game, um, Kinect Adventure. So, you know, as probably most of you have played this game. So in this case, you know, balls are being shot at you and you have to like hit it with your arms or your legs. So uh, again, you see some visual audio feedback. Then you decide, hey, I'm going to kick it or hit it. And then you actually do something. And this is, uh, again, popular. Uh, Angry Birds game, same same kind of steps. Like, okay, here's my my goal. I need to shoot these birds at these uh, at these pigs. So the idea is to kind of like you know, can we kind of like generalize these steps for playing a video game into like a generic model? Kind of like abstract these steps. So then we can kind of like understand a little bit better, like how do people play games and how does uh, a disability affect your ability to play? Video game. So you can kind of like synthesize, you can extract these steps, say, okay, you get feedback, then you decide cognitively what to do, and then you physically 
do something and then these steps repeat itself. So you can kind of like express this as a kind of like a finite state machine uh, where initially you get feedback from the game, then you cognitively decide, you know, what response to provide, then you physically provide a response and that those steps repeat itself until it's game over or you with the game. So how does uh, a visual impairment uh, affect your ability to um, play a video game? Uh, well, in general, uh, this, you know, this primarily pertains to getting feedback from the game. I should actually show this slide first. Uh, this is, so I'm, visual impairments is only one of my research interests, but in general we have established that different types of impairments affect your ability to play to a different extent. So for the first step, like receiving feedback, sensory impairment, being visually impaired or hearing impaired, uh, affects your ability to understand you know, the stimuli that the game provides you. Then for determining your response, like cognitive impairments could affect your ability to interpret visual and auditory information to uh, decide what kind of in-game response to provide. And then a physical impairment, so you know, you might uh, you might be unable to use a regular game controller, you might you know be confined to a wheelchair, so you can't like use a connect to do kicks and jumps. Um, so it's really interesting to see how, you know, from our initial interaction design model, how different types of impairments uh, affect your ability to play a game. And someone who's visually impaired might be perfectly able to cognitively determine, hey, you know, if this happens, I should provide that response. But simply because they're unable to receive feedback from the game, they, they will not be able to engage in those steps. Let me just go back to the previous slide. So visual impairments are very, uh, come in various forms. Um, you know, you can be completely blind, so you don't see anything. But typically, most people uh, with visual impairments have different types of visual impairments. So you could have like retinas, pigmentosa, so you only have some central vision. Uh, or you could have macular degeneration, where you kind of like, it's very blurry in the center, and you only have some peripheral uh, vision. You could also be colorblind, so you might not be able to distinguish different colors. It's sometimes it's very difficult to play like a game like the Jewel, and you're unable to distinguish different uh, Jewels. So this kind of like, you can kind of understand this is uh, you know, how a visual impairment uh, affects your ability to play games. I'm very interested in blindness, you know, being unable to see anything from the game. So how do we deal with if you're unable to see any visual feedback and audio feedback and haptic feedback? And the idea with sensory substitution is if you're unable to see visual feedback, well, maybe we can convert it into another modality of feedback. Maybe we could use haptic feedback or audio feedback. And in, in uh, video games, uh, this has been already researched uh, a little bit, uh, mostly for like regular types of software, but things like closed captioning is, a, is an example of sensory substitution where you actually convert audio dialogue into subtitles for someone with a hearing impairment who is, um, can understand what I'm saying. Um, the other way around, if you're visually impaired uh, and you want to surf the web, you could use a, an application like a screen reader which produces synthetic speech, basically takes text and produces synthetic speech. Uh, you can also, for people who are visually impaired, you can also use like a braille display, I don't know if anyone has ever seen it, but it basically um, converts text into like little haptic stimuli that people can interpret. The basics of sensory substitution sound very similar. Like, oh, okay, you know, if you're unable to see, you could use uh, speech synthesis or braille, or you're unable to hear, you could use closed captions. But it's not as simple as it looks. Um, different types of modalities have different types of temporal spatial uh, resolution. So visual information, you can, you can interpret large amounts of stimuli at the same time, where if you were to listen to someone talk and three people are talking at the same time, it already becomes very hard to tune in um, into one conversation. So these um, different modalities have different types of bandwidth. So you cannot convert all visual information into haptic information or audio information all at once because it would basically lead to a sensory overload. You're unable um, to perceive that kind of information in that modality uh, at the same time. So some of the recent challenges that I'm looking at is like, okay, you know, how can you deal with, you know, if you have a large amount of visual information, and that's typically what games do, games really provide you with large amounts of information, how can you convert it into audio or haptic? You need to, you need to Apply tricks. Um, so that's basically what I'm interested in. 
let's continue on um, you know, providing some arguments for why people with visual impairments should be able to play games. Because a long time ago, when I started this research, you know, people, I've been submitting papers, and people were saying, well, why would blind people want to play games? You know, don't they have anything better to do? Uh, I sincerely believe that you know, everyone um, should have the ability to play video games, uh, regardless of how popular things are. Nowadays, games are super popular, but you know, 20 years ago, it was kind of like seen as an elusive uh, pastime. I believe for users and gamers with disabilities in general, uh, games and virtual worlds can offer many uh, benefits. So there's social benefits, um, things like Second Life, there's large social communities in there, uh, Minecraft, people are all playing it together, World of Warcraft, those are like really interesting social communities and people with disabilities in general are more socially isolated, so games could offer them new socialization opportunities. Education, uh, you know, games are increasingly being used as educational tools, even for you know, teaching uh, toddlers to read, things like Read the Rabbit. So even for uh, individuals with disabilities who have fewer opportunities to you know, get a degree because you know, they can maybe not like, uh, have the same amount of mobility as, as sighted people. So they have fewer opportunities to, to get an education. So maybe video games could help them also in that uh, purpose. A long time ago, things like virtual worlds, people will be making money selling stuff in Second Life, and I believe uh, there's also some employment uh, opportunities. Last but not least, uh, health is also a very important thing. One of my research projects investigates how we can actually develop exercise games for blind kids, because blind kids have fewer opportunities to be physically uh, active. Giving you some statistics on visual impairments, uh, currently, there are about 1.3 million people in the U.S. who are totally blind, and it includes about 60,000 uh, children. Uh, there are 6.8 million people who have a visual impairment, so that could be like you know, low vision, or um, so you know they can see a little bit, not a lot. And what's kind of worrying is that the number of people with visual impairments actually expected to double in the next decades, and basically because we have a you know, graying boom, baby boomer generation, the older you get. Uh, the more likely you're, you are to become uh, visually impaired. Another worrying thing is that um, visual impairments are also strongly correlated with obesity. And currently, we have an obesity uh, epidemic, childhood obesity. Our kids are uh, much less um, active than we were, and you know, part, partly that can be blamed on video games and TV. Um, so, as people are becoming more obese, uh, it's more likely to get diabetes, more likely to get cataracts. Um, you know, that leads to blindness as well. So it's a very interesting thing how obesity and blindness are related and the number of people with vision impairments is significantly going to increase over the, over the next, uh, next decade. So this is a population of uh, gamers, the users in general, that we cannot uh, ignore. Okay, going back. Um, the slide I showed you about uh, and I like kite surfing, snowboarding. Uh, I like extreme sports. Um, I also see this as a kind of a research challenge to do like extreme interaction design, developing interfaces for like extreme, uh, extreme players, people with unique uh, abilities. I really think the intersection of like interaction design and, and video games uh, is, is very interesting because you know games are kind of like the rocket science of software, right? How would you compare like, you know, the latest first person shooter versus like Twitter? I mean, games deal with like large amounts of information. People have to respond super fast. Uh, there's a ton of stuff going on. I mean, really, I really believe video games are like the rocket science of software. So this is a really unique intersection where, you know, if you can come up with the interface for people with disabilities, then disabilities can kind of like become a driver of innovation. And just let me show you an example. Uh, <coughs> Um, natural language interfaces, things like Siri, uh, with larger reliance, speech synthesis, and speech recognition, they really have their roots in developing assistive technology. And people have been developing systems for screen, screen readers already in the 80s, and things for automatic captioning for people with uh, auditory impairments. So a lot of the technology that's been developed for people with disabilities actually you know, ends up in our phones. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, in my research, I kind of like, um, you know, try to use that same paradigm where uh, 
uh, you know, set yourself these extreme uh, challenges, uh, you know, people always say, hey, you know, when people decided, or when the US decided, hey, we're gonna put a man on the moon, that led to a lot of interesting technologies and things like Velcro, and you know, it really drove uh, development of personal computers, and you know, even Tang was developed as part of the NASA channel. So I believe this intersection where we try to like develop these accessible interfaces for video games for people with disabilities, that can really lead to uh, new innovation and we can come up with a lot of solutions for people that don't have disabilities. Okay, I'm gonna continue with some of my uh, example accessible uh, interfaces. Um, I'm gonna talk about two different uh, projects. One is uh, focusing on virtual worlds um, and the other one is dealing with like gesture-based uh, interaction, uh, also known as like natural user interfaces. So the first project is called TextExcel, and the idea is to kind of like develop a natural language interface for virtual worlds. Um, anyone here ever played with Second Life? You guys are probably from the Minecraft generation, right? Or not? <laughs> yes, no? Okay. Uh, so a couple of years ago, virtual worlds were really big, and everybody was like, oh, you know, Virtual worlds are totally going to replace the web, and you know, everyone instead of using uh, instead of using you know the web, everybody will have a, an avatar. And it's kind of funny to see how we went from like you know Second Life to like Twitter. We actually went from like you know highly graphical environments to 140 characters. So it seems like we're moving in the, the wrong direction, but who knows? Maybe that will uh, come back. So virtual worlds are really popular, and I think they still are. Um, most, I think most well known is uh, Second Life, but there's also like Habo and uh, <coughs> Sony's Home there, Caniva. Has anyone ever played around with any of the other virtual worlds now? Okay. Um, so super popular, uh, been used in many, uh, for many uh, purposes. Uh, five, six years ago, people were really saying, oh, you know, virtual worlds are really gonna transform education. And a lot of universities like Stanford and MIT had campuses in Second Life, and uh, we're actually teaching classes there. People have been, there's still some faculty there are teaching classes in Second Life. And it's really cool, because it's free, you know, you have three interaction, it's a sound, video, a really great platform. I don't understand why uh, MOOCs are gonna, you know, offer you those flat 3D interfaces. So they can be used, virtual worlds are used for education, used uh, for museums. The Tech Museum in San Jose actually has a virtual campus in Second Life, which is really cool with a lot of really good uh, exhibits. Uh, virtual worlds are also a very great uh, platform for communities. There's a ton of different types of communities in Second Life. There's communities even for people with, um, with disabilities. So it's very important that you know people with vision impairments can also participate in that and they can have education opportunities and they can visit a museum and they can meet with other people in um, Second Life. So I started out with like, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make Virtuals accessible, and one of the things um, that we found was that. <coughs> so the, the web, uh, there's a lot of assistive technology ready to make the web accessible. So blind people can use like a screen reader. Has anyone ever played around with a screen reader? It basically produces synthetic speech. Maybe someone has ac accidentally activated like always X voiceover on their iPhone. It's really hard to turn off again. Uh, but it basically produces synthetic speech. Um, and this works really well for the web because the web is still like largely text-based. You know, there's a few images here and there as well. Um, but people provide like alternative descriptions for um, for images. So a screen reader can basically like you know parse the text. And blind people are very proficient actually in using screen readers. Uh, some of the screen readers produce like synthetic speech at a very high rate, so they can actually parse information pretty, pretty fast. So this works really well for the web. And if you try to hook up a screen reader to a virtual world which is basically just a number of pixels, uh, yeah, there's no output because, you know, there's no text. So we need to come up with uh, an, an alternative solution here. How do we turn those pixels into text? So um, I did a lot of research on that, and I was like, well, what kind of interface would we need to browse a virtual world? And uh, I kind of grew up a long time ago with, like, multi-user dungeon games. Has anyone ever played that, Zork? Great stuff, and some of the stuff is really old school, like from the 80s, and it's basically like a command line interface, a terminal, where you control a character in a virtual world, 
And you basically issue simple commands like, you know, move north, open chest, friends this guy in the face. Um, so by nature, those kind of interfaces are already like, you know, text only, they're hyperdiff, they use natural language, you don't have to learn specific commands, it basically has a simple interpreter. Uh, and, and consequently, those things are really accessible to a screen reader because it's, you know, doesn't produce a large amount of feedback, so you can easily hook up a screen reader to that. Those multi-user dungeon games are also kind of like the precursors of virtual worlds. That, those were like the first places where people would go and hang out with people and talk to each other. Um, so they're kind of the precursors of virtual worlds. So it makes, makes a lot of sense to kind of like use that kind of interface to also make um, things like Second Life accessible. So that's basically what we did. We built an interface on top of Second Life, which basically extracts text in an accessible uh, format. Uh, and that can be read by a screen reader. So we have an interface, a standalone application. We also have a web-based interface that produces synthetic speeds. And you can basically control your avatar using a number of commands for navigating, communicating, uh, exploration, and interaction. Um, some of the technology that we developed for this, uh, and again, this is not like new stuff. Some of the stuff already exists in like uh, the Zork, is uh, basically natural language interpreter. So we can just, you know, rather than saying, you know, having people learn one spe you know, specific commands for controlling their character. Um, you can just, you know, if you want to go somewhere, you can say, like, hey, walk there, or walk 10 feet, go, move. And they all move into, the, they all map into the same internal command for, mo for moving. We can use prepositions, adjectives. So we can, you know, you don't have to learn specific commands. It's intuitive, easy to learn, natural language interfaces. Uh, some of the um, problems we, um, we identified, uh, we kind of built kind of a spider that indexes Second Life content. We kind of, I, mean, I don't want to call myself the Google of virtual worlds, but we actually have a very sophisticated spider that uh, indexes uh, uh, Second Life's uh, content. And we actually studied it um, to kind of like understand, you know, some of the problems with the underlying infrastructure for our uh, solution uh, for our interface. So some of the things we found out is that Second Life is actually very densely populated with objects. So how is a virtual world like Second Life different from things like War, uh, World of Warcraft? Well, Second Life is entirely like user generated. So people just build, you know, they have a little uh, land, they build a bunch of stuff, they typically toss a lot of stuff on their land. So it's very densely populated with objects. So if you were to like, you know, get the name of each object and convey this to a user, you know, you would easily get overwhelmed with feedback. So you have something like, you know, you see a tree, a car, a dog, a cat, blah, 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 blah. So that's not really uh, very accessible. Another problem is that it's also very difficult to navigate because you know there's a ton of content in there, so you cannot just say I'm going to move 10 feet forward because very likely it's going to run into something. Another problem we did we identified is basically the exact opposite. So you know having very densely populated content, you know, could easily overwhelm the user with feedback. At the same time, we found that a large number of these objects actually didn't have any description at all. When people create content in Second Life, it is right click, new object, then an object by default is named object. And people kind of figure, oh, you can see what the object is, so why would I want to give it a name? So as a, as a result, nearly 40% of the objects in Second Life are called object, and that's completely uh, meaningless. So if I were to like query my environment, then our interface tells you, oh, there is an object, an object, an object. Yeah, I still have no clue uh, what it is, and it's basically the same problem as like, with the web, where a lot of the images on the web don't have any authentic <coughs> description, so they're, they're kind of like meaningless. <coughs> so when you want to navigate uh, using our client, text cell client, you can just type in like move north, you can give a direction, or you can just say move so many steps. You can move to a specific object or avatar, you can teleport. Uh, we implement this very simple, basic uh, pathfinding algorithm to like navigate around obstacles. Uh, if you really get stuck like into a wall or something, what we do is try to teleport you a little bit further, not like exactly where you want to be. Because we want to make the avatar appear as normal as possible. If you have like a weird avatar running around and teleporting uh, a few feet forward, that, that kind of like may look weird. And kind of want to make using our client, you know, be, make it appear as normal as possible. So. Um, Communication, so uh, you can talk to other people, you can say, you can whisper, you can mute people that are really noisy. Um, oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
uh, interactions. So this is really challenging. Like, you know, how do you actually get people to interact with stuff through a command that is client? Uh, that's pretty pretty hard. So you can we, we support some basic commands for sitting on stuff. You can touch stuff, uh, and then you know you might touch a billboard or an object. Something will happen, but we currently are not able to like something we still work on to kind of like provide you with a textual description of what happens. This is actually really a uh, very difficult uh, problem to solve. Um, in order to avoid getting overwhelmed with feedback, we basically uh, implement a mechanism that allows you like iteratively query stuff. So you can just simply type like, you know, what do I see or describe and it gives you like the high level description. So in this, in this scene, you, could, you know, we grab the objects around you uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Give, get the names of the objects, and then we provide you with like a description. So if you say, see something like you know, you see Avatar Geo, the objects share a fire and a dog, and then you can actually iteratively query. Uh, so if you want to get more information about the dog, you just type in describe dog, and you know, as soon as an object's name is being conveyed, that be, kind of becomes uh, queryable. And you can also ask like you know, where is the dog, stuff like that. Um, so this is actually. <coughs> You know, understanding your environment and compiling like very precise yet descriptive uh, description is actually a pretty hard uh, problem to solve. So we actually built some sort of, we call it the Cinderella scene synthesizer. And the idea is that, you know, um, we first kind of like uh, get all the objects within a certain range and the users can kind of like decide for themselves what this range is. So typically it could be something like 10 meters. Uh, so we prune everything out of there that is not within range. Then we remove all the non-descriptive objects, so things are called object or, you know. Uh, one of the things we notice is that, you know, people sell content on Second Life, and then in the object description, they put like, oh, you know, this is like a cool thing made by blah, 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 blah. But actually they don't, they use it for spam, they actually don't provide any descriptive information in there. Or what happens is a lot of people like, you know, they use one object and then they use, you know, build something new based on that object, so then it still has the original name. Uh, things like box 10 by 10 is something that uh, is part of a lot of names. Uh, so we remove those non-descriptive names. And then uh, we have uh, what we call a scene synthesizer. So users can specify a number of words. And this is basically the amount of content, an upper limit on the amount of content that they can feasibly access our interface. And the screen reader produces static speeds at a certain rate. So that can be very slow, like, you know, or it can be very fast. Some blind people are very proficient at it. So they can have a larger word, um, word limit. Uh, actually, there's a type in there, it's a word limit. Uh, the idea is then like, okay, you get, get the number of objects from uh, within range, and then you see, you know, if this is under the word limit, then you know, maybe we can actually add more information. If it's over the word limit, then we need to come up with some sort of abstraction and like reduce the amount of information. So I'm gonna give you some examples for abstraction. So let's say in this case you have, you know, there's a cat, a dog, a car, a bike, a car, a truck, and a pig. So the idea is then, okay, let's grab, let's grab a taxonomy of objects. And uh, instead of, you know, so you have a taxonomy for animals and vehicles. So you can actually apply some transformation, uh, which basically reduces these words to like there are three animals and three vehicles. So this works uh, pretty well. We have a number of uh, taxonomies implemented in that. Um, then the other case is, uh, you know, in this case, uh, the avatar, there's a dog, a cat, and a car around the, the avatar, and then, you know, the word limit might be more. So the idea is, that, okay, now we can actually add more detail, uh, so you can add more description, say, like, you know, there's a black cat or a brown dog, we can add some activity, and then if, you know, we, we kind of, like, in a certain order, apply these different transformations, and then we'll see if the apply transformation, the set of words, the set of descriptions still under the, the word limit. Um, so th those are some of the mechanisms that we implemented the, for that. We did a number of user studies, so we had a number of blind people, uh, invited them in our lab, um, had them perform a number of basic tasks, like, you know, you know, try the Second Life tutorial every time, whenever you sign up for Second Life, you have to go to this tutorial, it's very interesting. Then we do some basic exploration, like, you know, find objects, stuff like that interact with other avatars, and then interact with objects. So what we did is actually had a number of blind people use our client, and then we had kind of like a control group of sighted people use the regular Second Life uh, client, and then we basically measured, uh, this is like a 
performance time. So we found, obviously, that you know, our command line interface is slower for doing the tutorial exploration and interaction. But for communication and talking to other people, it was just as fast, which is kind of interesting. You know, we kind of anticipated already that it's, it was going to be slower just because you know, when you use a visual client, you can see a lot of things at once, where in our client, you have to like, iteratively uh, get information. But for communication, that's kind of like, uh, it doesn't really matter. And that's interesting because a lot of studies actually show that most of the time people in virtual worlds like World of Warcraft actually are interacting with each other and socializing, like 67% of the time they're socializing. So this, you know, our client is just as good as a regular Second Life client uh, for, for one of the most important aspects. Here's a little demo, I hope, hopefully the, let me look at the sound, get an idea. This is like a, so, if you listen to this for like more than 10 minutes, you're not blind, you'll drive me nuts, but, um, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very interesting. So we have like a standalone client for Windows, and we also now have like uh, a web-based client. So you basically, you can still use a screen reader, or you can just use produce the synthetic speech. We kind of get an idea of how this uh, how this works. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, you know how to make virtual worlds more accessible. Um, so the lack of metadata is a, is a very uh, a big problem. Uh, a lot of objects are called objects. Um, people don't you know when they create content, they don't do a good job. At properly naming their object. So um, this problem is uh, very similar to uh, you know, the image labeling problem uh, for web content. And uh, so some of the similarities and differences is that um, you know, web content, so through the images, uh, there's also uh, several approaches for automatically providing labels for uh, web images. I don't know if anyone's ever played with the Google image labeler. Uh, it's like a little game, and you have to like provide tags for images in a bin mass, and you can uh, label content. So we kind of um, believe that, uh, or we have good evidence that the problem for virtual content is actually a lot simpler. First of all, because you know, with the 2D image, you don't have to worry about like you have to worry about segmentation. Are you interested in the cat or in the mouse? Where all these objects in virtual in Second Life are all defined in isolation by themselves. They're all solid bodies, frames. Uh, so you can. You can create different viewpoints. So this is a really good approach to use like uh, machine learning regression models to uh, to learn from uh, to automatically recognize uh, content. So what we did is basically uh, the idea is you know you create a bunch of objects from different categories and you basically train uh, split back to machine regression models and then you know whenever you encounter an object uh, that you've never seen before you try to map to one of those categories. So. The, 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 the bad thing about it, you know, that we found that 40% of the objects in Second Life don't have a name, also means that 60% do have a name. So, you know, maybe you can kind of like learn from like inference, so, you know, you train a classifier based on what you know, and then you try to recognize the rest. Um, some of the problems we ran into is that, okay, you know, how do you define those object categories? How do you decide about like, you know, this is going to be vehicles, furniture, or cats? Um, and the idea is then, okay, well, you know, why don't we just get a bunch of grad students or undergrads cheaper and, you know, have them give them an object, provide, you know, have them label stuff. Um, this is obviously very, uh, you know, time consuming. Uh, so the idea was then to look at something called human computation. Uh, it was very popular a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, getting people involved and hopefully they can do it for free. So the idea was to, um, what we actually did is like build a game in Second Life. Uh, and it's basically a game that's being advertised by an agent, and you can just run up to the agent, and the agent says, "Hey, you want to play a game? Sure. Here's an object." And bam! Now you're going to play a scavenger hunt game. And uh, this game, so this game is called Seek and Tag. And the idea is that um, what we're trying to do is collect labels for objects, and also we're trying to derive taxonomies for object categories. <coughs> so the idea is. Um, Depending on where you are in Second Life, we'll just grab names for objects. And um, the game will ask you, you know, let's say there's a cat close to you, be like, okay, find a cat. The idea is then, okay, if, if this object is actually really a cat, because even if an object has a label, often those labels are not correct, then 
you know, you label it as a cat, and you go on to the next object. And the idea is like people play against this game against each other, and you know, the more objects you can label in a short amount of time, the more points you score. And in the meantime, we are actually deriving labels for objects. Uh, and those are like labels from objects that we uh, just grab uh, from the objects. And the idea is, and also, you know, rather than just getting, you know, confirming labels of objects, we're also trying to like understand like, how to build taxonomy. So you can also say, rather saying like, you know, find a cat, we ask people to like, okay, find an animal. So then, you know, if they label a cat, then we can derive these relationships. Okay, you know, a cat must be an animal, or a skateboard must be, you know, some form of transportation. So it's a really interesting approach that the game that can actually build taxonomies and verify labels. And then the idea is then, you know, get a bunch of labeling apps from a lot of people together, and then you um, compare them. Just a little demo. So it's basically an avatar attachment. It kind of looks like a little hand grenade. <laughs> um, and then it starts and it'll just ask you, okay, find, it's hard to read, but it says like, you know, find uh, furniture. So this is like a, try to come up with an object category. So now your avatar is running around and you, oh, here's, uh, you know, it's shared, it's part of furniture. So you go up there and you click a little hand grenade and then you confirm a label. Um, very interesting. Uh, so we did a little use study to see uh, you know, how effective is this compared to like, you know, doing manual labeling. So we just had a bunch of people play the game versus a bunch of people in the lab, you know, manually uh, giving labels. And we found that our approach actually is much faster. You, you require fewer labeling attempts to reach consensus on an object name, uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of the approach. Unfortunately, um, Second Life is kind of like weighing in popularity a lot. Um, so what we've done now is that uh, uh, yes, guilty as charged. We're using Amazon Mechanical Turk because it's really cheap and you can label at a very large uh, scale. And we currently have, uh, I think we've collected more than like sort of like half a million labeling attempts. And we've been able to build uh, a very accurate regression model and, uh, or sorry, SVM. And uh, we, we can uh, classify object, objects in Second Life now with very high uh, accuracy. Um, so currently, this project is almost ending, but uh, a couple things we're still interested in investigating, uh, and that's primarily like you know, how do you describe behavior of interactive objects? So you could have like you know, you click on an animal, it runs away, or a ball, it starts to like bounce up and down, or you touch a billboard and the video starts playing. Um, again, this approach, what we did is basically pull 100 objects out of Second Life, film them for like 15 seconds, and then feed them in Amazon Mechanical Turk, get large number of descriptions back from people. Uh, then do kind of like a semantic analysis of the descriptions, kind of understand what kind of properties of objects are interesting. Do people describe a changing call up before they say, okay, this object made sound. And then um, we're building like a forest so they can, to some extent, uh, extract this interactive behavior from an object by just basically you know, rendering a sequence of objects. And uh, the idea is then, we're using Amazon Mechanical Turk now again to, so for a parser, we'll just generate descriptions from objects and it will go back into Amazon Mechanical Turk to verify it, to kind of like see if it matches. Um, another thing that's very important is a uh, content creation. So Second Life is entirely user content generated. So uh, being able to create content is very important. So blind people do that too. Uh, so we have a very simple interface that, you know, kind of like treats objects in Second Life. Second Life kind of like works with prims. Those are like solid bodies that can be parameterized and you can actually glue them together and create larger objects. So we kind of, it's kind of like building stuff out of Lego. So we have a command line interface that allows you to just like type in like, you know, green, create green cube block one and then you create another one and you can glue them together um, by linking them. But this is really hard. Like, you know, for a blind person to kind of memorize, okay, I have a block here, a block there, it's really difficult. So. We also kind of like do content creation at a high level uh, because you know we have already a very large collection of objects that are very well labeled. So instead of like trying to build smaller objects out of out of out of these building blocks, you can now just say, okay, create a brown dog and bam, you just pop out the dog. Uh, very interesting. If you're interested in uh, trying this out, it's open source. Go to go to Google.com. You can contribute. Uh, if you want to try to find, go to ear.texasl.org and a bunch of papers. Okay, I'm gonna go on to my next project. I think I have about eight, eight, eight minutes left. This is a project I'm very passionate about. 
exercise games. You guys play Connect? Yeah. And the Wii Sony Move? Pretty cool, right? Um, <coughs> so this all involves like gesture-based interaction, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Nintendo with their Wii uh, basically pioneered you know completely new ways of playing games, really using natural interfaces, like you know mimicking up, you know rather than playing tennis by pushing a button on the controller. There's no correlation with the real world. Instead, uh, we're using motion sensing controller and you know really playing tennis how people play tennis in real life. So definitely revolutionized. Uh, video games and really boosted the extra game genre into the $10 billion industry that it is now. Um, so again, going back, this relies on visual cues. So let's take, for example, the boxing game. Uh, you know, there's visual cues, your opponent throws a punch, you block, you know, your opponent lets his guard down, you punch him in the face. Um, so these visual stimuli, and, and it's to some extent there's also a little bit of audio, but it's not really tells you what to do and when. Um, so tying it to people with visual impairments, I've talked about this before, there's a large number of kids in the US that are blind, have fewer opportunities to uh, be physically active, much like higher levels of obesity. Actually kids, uh, you know, uh, blind kids actually have the highest levels of obesity. And it's not because, you know, they eat unhealthy. Uh, it's largely because they have no to few opportunities to be physically active. So blind people and blind kids, if they want to exercise, they kind of just run around because you know it's much more dangerous for them to like get seriously uh, injured. So they rely on a on a sighted guy to help them out. So they want to take a bike ride, you know, they'll go on a tandem bike. The sighted guy goes in the front, or you know, they want to, if they want to run, you know, someone is holding their hand, and obviously they can maybe use a treadmill too. But uh, for most activities, they rely on a sighted guy. Um, it's also much more dangerous for a blind person to like just run around. They're much more likely to get injured, uh, seriously injured. Blind people fall also a lot more. They have inefficient gait. Um, so those are some of the barriers. And then at the same time, you know, parents of blind kids typically don't want them to participate in physical education programs. I think it's something like uh, only one in ten kids with vision impairments actually participates in uh, physical education programs in, in their school. It's just, it's just really bad. And it's kind of like. You know, the parents try to protect them, but at the same time, it's it's actually harming them because blind kids actually need that kind of exercise to uh, be healthy. So, uh, given that there's a lot of a lot of studies come out showing that exercise games, not all exercise games, but some exercise games like dance-based games and whole body exercise games, uh, can yield levels of physical activity that are high enough to be considered healthy. The Center for Disease Control actually recommends kids engage into 60 minutes of moderate or vigorous physical activity. 20 minutes of those uh, should be vigorous. So I kind of like looked at that and was like, hey, you know, this could really help blind kids because, you know, exercise games, they're exercise in place. You know, you don't run around. You can play against the computer. You don't rely on a sighted guide. Um, low cost. And they could really uh, create large amounts of new exercise opportunities. So I set out to, you know, solve the research question, like, you know, how do we actually, you know, how do you play um, video games without, um, how do you engage in the gesture-based interaction without visual feedback? Okay, then, um, you know, looked a little bit more about, you know, a lot of these exercise games like Mimic Sports, you know, uh, you look at sports, uh, a lot of these physical activities are like spatial or temporal. That means, you know, like with basketball, you know, you have the ball, where am I going to pass it and when? So you have to solve these questions like, you know, you got to find something in this you know, location around you. And at the same time, you got to do something at a certain time. And a lot of those exercise games kind of like um, involve like target acquisition, uh, you know, finding a location to, to do something. Things like with the exercise games with the uh, Kinect, uh, you know, you got to play tennis, you got to hit the ball at the right time or like uh, with the Kinect, you got to punch something with your arm left or right. Um, so target acquisition is very um, uh, important. Um, yeah, like I said before, a lot of those games are temporal, spatial, uh, jump at a certain time, punch something at a certain time. Um, so for sensory substitution research, uh, we try to come up with, okay, how do you do target acquisition, not on the screen, but like in a space around you? How do you perform directed gestures like punch something left, punch something right? Um, and one of the things we, we notice immediately is like, 
analyzing exercise games is that sounds already play such a major role in exercise games. A lot of these exercise games are played in social contexts. You play together. A lot of those exercise games use music, like I took Kinetic or Dance Revolution. They're very music driven. So using audio as a modality for feedback for sensory substitution is actually not really that good. If, a blind, if I play a game with a blind kid and the blind kid has to listen to the audio all the time and I'm like shouting like, ah, oh, you know, I just scored a point, that just like disrupts the gameplay. That doesn't really work. So we kind of have to look into like the haptic modality. So we investigated this research using a number of uh, games and we kind of started out very simply. Uh, we just took an excess game that only involved a temporal challenge. So has anyone played Wii Tennis? So Wii Tennis, it doesn't really matter if you hit left or right. It, they kind of like make it sound like it is, but it's not. It's only a temporal challenge. You gotta hit the ball at the right time. So uh, we looked at like the modalities of feedback that were being used. This is something called a sensory substitution uh, map. And it basically, for Wii Tennis, we basically list all the types of feedback. So we have audio, visual, and haptic feedback. And we list basically the feedback that are being provided. So you hear sound cues, you see the ball come down the screen. And there's even some haptic feedback when you successfully serve. And the idea is that, okay, you know, we take away all the visual feedback and then convert some of that visual feedback into, uh, into haptic feedback. So we ended up with a solution where you basically only, um, whenever you have to hit the ball, there's like a short window, we provide a haptic cue, and then when the ball bounces, you provide a haptic cue. And uh, that basically allows you to play uh, the tennis game. We call it VI tennis. Then, so we kind of so this is one strategy for the for, for um, developing for making a, a temporal challenge accessible. Then we kind of uh, <coughs> solve the game that only has a spatial challenge, and it's kind of funny that we tennis and we bowling, one has a temporal challenge, the other one has a spatial challenge. Anyone, anyone's played we bowling? The only what you need to do is basically find the location of the pins and then throw your ball. Uh, so how do you make that accessible? So what we did, we actually developed a new technique. We call this uh, it's something called like a tactile proprioceptive display. And um, the idea is um, proprioception is the human ability to understand relationships of your, your your body. So if I, you know, they, do, they call it like a field sobriety test when you get uh, pulled over by, you're unable to do it. But uh, you can actually like, Proprioceptive information is very, uh, very interesting modality feedback. It's not haptic, it's not audio, it's not. Uh, so what we do is we develop a technique where you basically combine haptic feedback with proprioceptive information. So you could create a little application. For example, if I want to find out where the north is from where I stand, so I could just like, you know, create an app that looks at my compass and I move my arm around and it starts buzzing when I'm actually pointing north. Now I know, okay, you know, my my phone is pointing north, now I know my arm is point, pointing north. So this is basically, we're using proprioceptive information to uh, communicate uh, a spatial location. So we developed a technique. Uh, with the Wii Remote, you find, you scan your environment. At some point you feel a haptic feedback, and when the haptic feedback is strongest, that means you're actually pointing directly at the location of the pins. Then you can basically throw uh, the ball So this is a completely new technique that we use to kind of like um, acquire uh, spatial information about your environment using haptic feedback. This is a sensory substitution map. Um, we did a bunch. Of, I, I, every summer I go to, uh, to the university, uh, State University, Cortland. They have a big uh, camp for blind kids, uh, sports camp, about 100 blind kids. So every summer we go there and test a bunch of games. And uh, we found for the tennis and the bowling game, you know, measured heart rate, accelerators, we actually measured their physical activity and found that these are games actually engage kids into uh, levels of physical activity that are high enough uh, to be healthy. Some of the things we work on now is um, a lot of these upper body gesture games like Nintendo Wii, they only use one arm. And although some of our games actually get you into moderate levels of physical activity, it's really desirable to be moderate and vigorous. Vigorous is really, you know, that's really what the good exercise is. And it's basically the difference between like walking and running. So um, the idea is then, you know, if a game that uses one arm gets you into moderate, you know, how do we get to vigorous? Well, you know, use more limbs, like use your legs, use your arms. So
So uh, some of the stuff we're working on is like whole body exercise games. This is a little game we developed called Pet and Fan. It's kind of like a whack-a-mole game where you have to hit, hit uh, rats and pet kitties. I'm just going to show you a little video for both games. Um, so this is like a, a whack-a-mole game. And it's just using haptic feedback and audio. So, you know, making Wii games accessible is easy because, you know, we have a controller that can provide haptic feedback, really cool, but then Microsoft comes out with a Kinect, and there's no controller. So, hmm, how do we make that accessible? And everybody wants to play Kinect games. So what we did is, uh, again, you know, look <coughs> how you play those games. And we noticed actually something. A lot of these Kinect games use this. So this is a Rebels game. So you're running, you're running, you're running. See that? The turtle lights up. Yellow, get ready, green, jump. So what we did basically, we hacked the solution where basically we can make some of these Kinect games accessible without actually modifying the game at all. What we do is uh, basically use a video capturing system with an external laptop and then basically, you know, define on the screen like, hey, you know, look for this visual cue. If this happens, then we use uh, a simple, we use some Wii remote controllers, so we're marrying the, the, the Nintendo and the Microsoft uh, system together. And the same thing works for the for the Javelin game. And uh, we provide a haptic cue, so this, uh, we, we don't start to blind people, they're basically jogging, holding two Wii remotes, and then the Kinect would still see their body, and then when they feel a cue, they jump. It works, works uh, pretty well. Uh, my last thing I'm gonna show you is, uh, it's pretty cool. Just to show you as an example, uh, so I'm gonna start with working on now. This is like the haptic steering interface. Um, this is a blind student who's actually driving a vehicle on the track. We basically hacked uh, a steering wheel, two Sony move controllers, and provide haptic cues. So the idea is like, we know the exact position of the vehicle on the road, and if you have to steer left or right, we'll just provide a cue on the left. Means like, it's kind of like inspired by rumble strip, so you know when you hit a rumble strip, oh, you steer away from that. The idea is then, you provide haptic feedback and, um, to the left or to the right, depending on how much you need to steer. We can correct it uh, too. This is an interesting example because we kind of set out to develop uh, kind of a racing simulator for blind people. And she's actually driving on like a track with like 50 kilometers an hour. And the standard deviation for the lane mediation is like less than a meter. So it's really good. And, like this is blind people driving uh, a vehicle. I mean, it's restricted to a track, but still, it's pretty interesting. And this is like one of the projects that, uh, you know, we kind of set out to make something accessible for people that are blind, but it also can help people that are sighted because I don't know if anyone's ever driven from Reno to the Bay Area in the winter around five o'clock when you have super low sun and you get a lot of accidents. People get uh, blinded and it's a major, uh, major cause of uh, single vehicle accidents. We've also evaluated this interface with sighted people and just like simulate steering to a, a turn and then, um, simulating like a blindness and we found that our interface also helps uh, keep the vehicle on the road so now we're trying to like uh, get more uh, you know get car companies interested in, in, uh, in using this uh, technology again uh, if you're interested in this stuff grants publications go to vifit.org we haven't been sued by Nintendo yet so uh, it's still around you can download all the games if you have blind friends Hook them up, get them a, go to Amazon, get a $10 Wii remote, and you can play all the games for free. It's really cool, um, help people out. Any questions? Um, so, going back to the, the Second Life example that you're talking about, how do you uh, determine what's bad data versus good data? Because if somebody's like getting points for just naming stuff, I could just name stuff like yeah. random arbitrary net names and not necessarily be accurate. We, uh, we basically compare tagging results with each other. So we just try to find like, you know, there's confirmation on the label. So if more, more than three people agree on the name for a label, then it gets put into a set. 
So if someone just says like it's a cat and it otherwise no, it's a dog, then there will be no consensus and we'll toss it out. That's a good idea. Do you, uh, do you notice any difference between people who were born blind and people who became blind later in life? How much they enjoy the games? Uh, I didn't, we didn't see that as a factor in, in, um, in, in the difference, but we do, I mean, we've tested with people that were able to play games before and then got blind and then were able to play games again, and they're pretty positive, but especially the kids that are, born, that are congenitally blind, they go crazy at the camp. I've been going to this camp for like four years now, and there's still like, there's still kids that will be like, they talk about the games all the time because, you know, they never have an opportunity to play a video games, so for them it's just amazing. Like, it's, yeah. A lot of these kids have never played games before. So. It seems like with like uh, the Second Life thing, they're kind of uh, as a blind player, you're kind of experiencing the game in a different way that you'd experience reality because you're kind of like seeing. Where like I feel like a blind person in in reality, it's mainly like touch and yeah. sound and like. It, have you thought about like uh, making some some way of like simulating how they normally experience? We uh, so now. So our interface basically is synthetic speech because you know you can convey information using text very fast, and you know that kind of like takes away from like you know in Second Life you might hear music and sound. So we've also thought about doing some sort of like audio, you know, landscaping kind of uh, you know kind of giving a, an idea what's going on. But uh, yeah, then, then you're you, you're really restricted in the amount of information. I've seen some solutions that use like haptic feedback to kind of like you know, figure out where you are as navigation, but. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to investigate. There was one question. Okay, one last question. Um, uh, I have to... That's, that's definitely something we can, uh, we, we look into, but most of the stuff we do, um, so for these exercise games, you could use surround sound, but another thing that we, wanted to do is a lot of assistive technology is super expensive, like screen readers cost like you know, thousands of dollars. So we really wanted to keep the cost low so if you could use a, you know, for the excess games, if you could use a regular sound system. You could also use like a surround sound, but it would make it a lot more expensive. But it's something definitely we, uh, we, we want to look into eventually. Yeah, you mentioned that one of the challenges you face is to um, direct knowledge about the objects. Yeah. Companies like eBay have very sophisticated taxonomies for listing stuff, which you could also just use, and we've actually uh, looked at that as well. But the problem is that the content of the Second Life is a little bit, uh, you know, people really build like little houses and furniture and then put billboards everywhere. So we were like, well, you know, rather than just like imposing a real world taxonomy, maybe we should just derive a taxonomy from kind of like bottom up based on what objects are there. Um, so, but it's a good suggestion, it was something we have explored. Is there a quiz for this? I oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so, sorry, 